In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zeiger livecast. Good evening, Amsterdam, and good evening, Istanbul. Welcome to the eighth live cast of Infected Cities. These series are created by Dutch Culture and Pakhuis de Zwijger. And my name is Zoe Papa Ikonomu, and I am your host today. So in the weekly series Infected Cities, we will focus on different cities throughout the world that are hit by corona crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic has an enormous impact on vital areas of our lives, such as employment, healthcare, and social services. In this program, we will specifically zoom in on the cultural sector and on how cultural professionals are looking for creative and social solutions to the current pandemic. So today, we will talk about the impact of coronavirus on Istanbul. We will talk about how the pandemic is currently impacting cultural organizations, society, artists, and more. So before we start our program filled with the many interesting guests, uh, I have a few general remarks as always for our audience. Thank you very much for joining us uh, via live stream on Facebook and the Pakhuis de Zwijger website. So if you want to participate or ask questions, that's definitely possible and you can do this through Zoom. So you can go to the chat and chat amongst yourselves as visitors. But if you have a question for our guests, please go to the Q&A and I will do my best to ask as many questions for you. So it's time for the, uh, uh, some in background information on in in Istanbul, <laughs> Istanbul and some uh, uh, facts about the corona numbers. Uh, Istanbul is one of the largest cities in the world and has a population around 15 million people. So in Turkey, there has been over 190,000 infections and more than 5,000 people have died. Uh, the first corona infection was detected in March and uh, Turkey went into lockdown. Uh, and it has been uh, starting to reopen again slowly in the past few weeks, uh, just as we see in the Netherlands. So we will start this live cast uh, with a conversation about the current situation in Istanbul. Uh, we will also talk uh, after that about urban planning in times of pandemic. Uh, we will then uh, uh, talk with two visual artists, uh, photographers, and in the last part we will talk about the impact of corona on the arts and cultural sector in Istanbul. Uh, before we start, I would also like to introduce the guest sitting next to me. Uh, welcome, Ekim Tan. Thank you. Uh, urban designer and architect. We will speak with you a little bit later on in the program, but we are very happy to have you here in Pakhuis de Zwijger. Thank you, Zoe. Um, so it's time to introduce our first two guests who are joining us to talk about the current situation uh, in Istanbul. Uh, these are uh, Yashar Adnan Adanele, um, urbanist, and also Toon Beemsterboer, who is the correspondent for NRC, Dutch newspaper in uh, Turkey and Greece. Welcome to you both. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. So Yashar, if I can start with you, can you tell us about your experience uh, being in Istanbul during this pandemic in the past few months? Sure, uh, I guess we, uh, we should state from mid-March until the 1st of June, we had experienced the pandemic deeply in Istanbul. Uh, for the last time, uh, we met in our office at Center for Spatial Justice on 16th of March, and then we decided to go to our home and be part of the, not enforced, but uh, kind of enforced lockdown, stay at home, stay safe campaign. And me, I personally didn't leave my house until the beginning of June, mm. to, to an extent that I didn't even went out for shopping. And just to give you an idea, I'm living right in the center of the city, around 80 square meter house with a, a cat and a flatmate with no balcony and kind of quite a small space. Uh, and I, 
despite the fact that I'm against app-based shopping because I, I like to cherish my local businesses, I only used app-based shopping during that time so that I have minimum contact with, uh, uh, with, with the fellow uh, Istanbulites. Um, we had a targeted lockdown uh, for those who are below 20 year old and above 65 year old. Mm -hmm. They couldn't leave their home even if they want to, even if they had to. And during the weekends, we also had uh, enforced lockdown all around Istanbul to keep the numbers low, especially to lower the pressure on the hospitals. Of obviously, all the cultural, entertainment, commercial, uh, and public spaces were closed down. Most of the shops uh, were closed down during that period. And the demand for public transport also lowered to uh, 85% uh, during that two months period. And yeah, that was the first time that I ever experienced anything like that in Istanbul, a huge city with 15, 16 million people always bustling. And for the first time as an urbanist, I had this kind of fix, being in the middle of this very lonely, very quiet, very kind of uh, a different city, uh, the city without humans. So, uh, Tone, also welcome. Thank you for joining us. So, how was your experience in Istanbul for the past few months during lockdown? Uh, like Yashar said, it was a very surreal experience. I mean, this is this is, city is like an ant's nest. I mean, normally, if you walk over the street, there's people everywhere. You know, there's boats crossing the Bosporus. It's, you know, it's, it's a big city. There might even be, you know, more close to 20 million people than officially it's 15. So there's a lot of people living here. Um, and, and it was deserted. I mean, I live close to the Galata Bridge. And uh, you could go out during the day and, and, and sometimes even spot the dolphins because, you know, there weren't any people around anymore. So they weren't afraid to come to the shore. Uh, so that made a very surreal experience. And you could oh. see actually that, you know, different people were hit in a different way by, by, by these measures that the government took. First of all, I think, you know, the government acted uh, quite early uh, by, by, by locking down. I mean, I think they, they took these measures like a week after the first case was discovered. Um, so in that sense, you know, they, they, they managed to keep the, all the, they keep the outbreak uh, contained. I mean, although the, uh, the numbers are quite high, 190,000. I think Turkey at one point was the, the, the tenth biggest outbreak in the world. The death toll is quite low with 5,000 people. I, you know, they did they did better than Holland in that regard. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, there are some questions about these figures because Turkey doesn't fully follow the WHO uh, rules uh, regarding that. You know, about. Uh, whether you, when you uh, count someone as a corona uh, death. But nevertheless, I mean, you know, uh, it, it went quite well. And now you, now you see that the country is opening up. People are, are uh, it's mandatory, <laughs> cheers. It's mandatory to wear masks. So basically now you see that, you know, since the 1st of May, the, con the country started slowly opening up again. Bars are open, terraces are full, etc., etc. But still it keeps, it, it, you know, this little bit surreal atmosphere. Uh, some bars, they only put drinks in plastic cups, uh, you, you know, also like a takeaway thing or even co coffee places are doing the same. So, and, and. I wanted to go to a restaurant, for instance, uh, two weeks ago for the first time. And although the country officially opened up already, uh, many restaurants were still closed. So you, you can definitely sense that people are still wary and still, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they definitely have to see where this is going before they, uh, they fully open up and, 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 and feel comfortable again outside. Uh, so Yashar, as you just described, you are also you're an urbanist. Can you describe a little bit the effects of uh, of these uh, measures and uh, the epidemic on the different communities and neighborhoods of Istanbul? Sure. I mean, when we say Istanbul, we are not really talking about only one city. Istanbul is a huge city. 
actually there are 39 districts within Istanbul and you can consider these 39 districts as a city in themselves. So uh, that means the impact of uh, the viruses and the measures are quite diverse according to which part of the city. Uh, one thing is uh, clearly the working class neighborhoods, especially along the northern axis of the highways uh, that cuts the city from west to east axis, we see higher concentration of risk. Uh, the Ministry uh, of Health uh, had an app that you can check which part of Istanbul have higher uh, risk than, as you see now at the screen, and which parts have a lower risk based on the official uh, 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 patients and the one that they get in touch with. Here on this map that you see at the moment, the northern part is a, a kind of working class, lower income neighborhood, extremely dense, divided by with a highway and infrastructure, uh, transport infrastructure. And on the southern part, you see a very low risk area, which is middle, middle, high income groups. Uh, living in a more detached area with more green spaces, uh, high rises that have a minimum human contact. So we have to emphasize this fact that not everyone, not everyone could stay at home during the pandemic. Those working class has to go to the factories or they had to clean our uh, streets or they have to kind of collect our garbages. So they were more prone to the, the, to the virus. And then they went back to their more cramped neighborhoods where they were more in touch with their families and their neighbors. And obviously uh, the risk were higher on these areas. So, and, and Tone, I'm also wondering, um, um, are there like aid packages uh, from, from government or are people uh, within communities helping each other out at this moment? Yeah, both. I mean, the government came, you know, with an aid package like like many other countries did. Um, it was not as big though as as many European countries because before the Corona crisis hit Turkey, uh, the Turkish economy was already in a fragile state. Um, so the coronavirus came on top of that. But nevertheless, I mean, they made a package saying that companies could not fire anyone and uh, companies could uh, apply for, for money from the government or loans, um, stuff like that. Um, so that definitely helped a little bit to ease the pain. Uh, but I don't think that all the companies uh, got access to this. And what you also have to keep in mind that it, it sounds good that you know companies cannot fire anyone, but there are many, many people in Turkey that that live uh, from day to day. You know, they, they are day laborers or they they work on a zero-hour contract. So these people can be easily laid off, and and you can, uh, and then next to that, there's also a large refugee population. Uh, I mean, there's on a, already almost 4 million Syrian refugees in Turkey and then there's also the other groups uh, and you can definitely see now that the country is opening up a bit that you know there's much more beggars on the street uh, next to garbage big garbage cans you can see women with children trying to sort out like the most edible stuff from from the garbage it's it's heart-wrenching to see so there's definitely you know the lower income like yashar also said like lower income groups are, are definitely much much worse hit than uh, than the others so and and what what would you say tone are the the consequences for the domestic and and foreign policy of uh, turkey I mean, what you noticed actually during this corona pandemic, there was the, the broke a fight out between uh, the, the big cities are now in the hands of opposition mayors. They wanted to manage this crisis themselves. And then there's uh, President Erdogan uh, in Ankara who wanted to centralize the aid for coronavirus victims. Um, and this turned, out, turned into some kind of power struggle, whereas you know both wanted to distribute it, the boxes with with food aid with you know the stamp uh, presidency or the 
stamp um, municipality of Istanbul. So, for instance, uh, President Erdogan decided that um, the municipalities would not be in charge of the uh, the corona aid, but it would be the government, uh, the governors, sorry. Uh, the governors are appointed by him. So in this way, he kind of sidelined the municipalities and 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 he kept uh, the aid uh, as much as possible in his own hands. So, uh, and a uh, final question, uh, Yassar, for you. So, um, uh, as you just described at the beginning, uh, people have been at home for a very long time, you yourself as well. Um, how is the city right now and how was it to, to be able to go outside again? <coughs> Well, uh, I think people really kind of uh, had enough in their homes and they, in a very liberal way, went uh, uh, to the city streets and open spaces and, and shops, even though some of them still closed down. And that's also alarming for, uh, uh, for the public authorities as well as some of the concerned citizens. Uh, the masks has been uh, not used properly and people kind of uh, get relaxed on social distancing and as if nothing really happened, as if this extraordinary two months hasn't been experienced in Istanbul. Uh, so we, we started discussing this is not right way. I mean, one day... We are stuck in our house and the next day everyone is just outside and doing, you know, whatever we were we used to do before the pandemic. And that in a way reminds a bit our attitude towards earthquake. We are and Istanbul is expecting the huge earth, earthquake. We had the earthquake in 1999 and right after the earthquake, we were so worried about what's going to happen. Uh, we have to be kind of ready and then we forgot so quickly. And uh, uh, everyone knows the big earthquake is going to hit the city in the next uh, decade or two. Uh, but we try not to think about it. So I see the similarities of the attitudes of the Istanbul citizens for the pandemic as well. So, uh, Toon Beemsebour, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. Yashar, you will stay with us for the next part, where we will dive deeper into urban planning, also with Ekim Tan sitting next to me. Um, Ekim, so uh, as I introduced you before, you are an architect and urban designer. Uh, can you uh, tell, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? Yeah, uh, well, I am uh, born and raised in Istanbul and I studied there uh, um, also architecture, not in Istanbul, in Ankara. So like for me, uh, and then uh, I came to Delft as a stu master's student to study urban design and uh, started my PhD. And that PhD was about uh, like basically looking into organic and uh, top-down planning systems, which lo was looking into uh, like basically gaming, how that can stimulate those. So now the PhD got out of hand. I have a company actually in this building in Amsterdam, but we occasionally uh, also run projects in Istanbul. So for me, going back to Istanbul after becoming an urbanist was actually 2010. So this is also a project from 2010. Um, and yeah, to look at Istanbul, to learn from like, Istanbul with a professional eye has been, I think, since 2010. And since then, it, we are back and forth in Istanbul. Yeah. So what is what, what we are seeing here? Are these like sort of, sort of games or what is it exactly? Yeah, uh, so th what we see here is uh, uh, actually uh, what uh, um, uh, Adnan was, uh, Yashar was Yashar, referring yeah. to, uh, the, the earthquake and post-earthquake, what Istanbul actually needs to be uh, looking at. So how uh, um, be beginning of 2000s and, and I think in, in the first uh, uh, decennia we were talking about the urban transformation a lot, how Istanbul should transform its its neighborhoods, especially post-earthquake. So this uh, that particular game was looking into how a large-scale housing corporation, which is in, in, in I think it's in Turkey, it's acting from the national scale and producing most of the housing schemes. So how such a big housing company can actually uh, potentially collaborate with homeowners or small-scale uh, developers to actually make more uh, uh, yeah, uh, human-friendly environments. And, and the, the, the idea was conducted in such a way that people who are representing uh, this housing corporation, but also local governments, NGOs, uh, they were around the table to negotiate alternative uh, urban transformation schemes back in Istanbul. 
So, and, and could you give us a bit of more context what the differences are between urban planning in Amsterdam and a city of Istanbul? Yeah, well, the <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay. So Maybe large, a large question. <laughs> yeah, I think if I really have to abstract it, in a, in a, I think you can see maybe... Uh, uh, Istanbul has been um, in the last century more uh, like organically growing city. So you, you would see a big uh, pace of migration from rural areas to urban centers as Istanbul. And that meant that actually no official plan uh, led the urbanization. So mm -hmm. it was fast, uh, first Gecekonda environment, like self-built neighborhoods that then um, became uh, more uh, legal, let's say. That meant that they actually got the right to uh, densify more and, and, and build more official contractors. Mm -hmm. And then uh, densifying and redensifying itself. And then with the earthquake and after that with the political shift, what we see is in urban planning in Turkey is a big, centralization. So I think in many other sectors, but also in our sector, we see large scale urban projects, urban infrastructure projects that are shaped mostly by the national government or uh, mm -hmm. depending also where the power is, the political power taking. taking. And, and I think in the Netherlands, in a way, it's the other way around where we have we have been used to, I think, in the last century, more top-down schemes where you know government and housing, large-scale housing corporations operating to uh, like uh, participation, some living like participation society, also termed like as a way to see how social welfare state can actually step back and how we can decentralize. So I think we, where we see here is the other way around. Actually, how can we decentralize our planning processes? And it has its own problems as well. Uh, so I think like if I have to yeah, you know, <laughs> explain in a nutshell, yeah. <laughs> that's what it no, is. It was like the largest question ever. No, I understand. <laughs> no, but this is a very good insight. So Yashar, what, what would be from your urbanist perspective uh, be the main problems that surfaced uh, in Istanbul during the pan pandemic? Well, uh, first thing, since we were all expected to stay at home, the quality of housing, the right to housing is actually a big issue, still is a, a, a huge issue. Uh, we didn't all stay in uh, similar houses. Some families, extended families, they have to kind of cramp in small spaces with no access to open uh, spaces in a near uh, vicinity of their houses. Or uh, not enough having privacy in these domestic spaces because of the quality of housing, because of the lack of adequate housing. The lack of green spaces is the second uh, point that we have to highlight. Istanbul has been going through a construction boom in the last two decades, and any kind of open green spaces were planned as a, a mega project of so, a sort of like a shopping malls or gated communities or uh, a, a huge infrastructure investment. But the open green spaces are not protected. And these days we realize how important they are, like to be just outside, to be just having access to clean air and greenery that's become extremely important during the uh, pandemic. The public transport now that we are all scared to be in these uh, 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 public transport modes which are extremely crowded, so which also highlight that uh, there has to be more investment in pedestrian and cycling uh, systems as well as uh, lower the density demand on the public transport. Istanbul is heavily car oriented still, even though there has been a lot of investment in public transport. Mm including metro lines, still car is the major. And now, unfortunately, with the pandemic, people are more willing to take their private cars because they're afraid. So this is going to be the next big challenge, how to convince people to kind of be relaxed and comfortable and safe in the public transport system as well. And not but, uh, uh, but not least, uh, finding the, uh, the support mechanism for the urban poor, for those unemployed, for those who lost their kind of uh, uh, livelihood opportunities uh, during the past months and developing social policies to address uh, the most vulnerable part of the society is going to be a big challenge in the next uh, months ahead.
So, uh, listening to Yashar Eki, mm -hmm. what, what, what would you say the, the priority should be uh, for urban planners in Istanbul? Yeah, I think I will continue where Yashar left. I think the social policies, I mean, that, that, I mean, we have seen in the last 20 years, let's say, large scale projects with, you know, the, a lot of construction projects and the whole economy of the country is now depend, was depending on it. And, and if you look at the current mayor, for example, his promise was no large project. He was only promising social peace. You know, and, and that we can hope uh, that we can actually, you know, the, 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 we can build trust. So I think that, that, that where, he, where he left, actually, that, that's where we have to, I think, be, before or during or after the pandemic to see how we can actually build uh, social, social peace among different groups that are not trusting anymore. And urban planning has, uh, has, has a, can play a role there indeed. And I think public spaces and how parks, how, I don't know, places for children, for example, really soft spaces of the city can be actually push the fo uh, foreground and they can become, let's say, the mega projects of everyone that every, like women can find, uh, find themselves, children find, can find themselves, elderly, everyone else. And, and I think that, that, that I think is the most important agenda that should be actually also before, before the pandemic anyways, and now more even. So, but how do we make it? It's a question for both of you, I guess. How can we, how should we make sure that it's not only talking about it, but that it's actual, will be actual change. Yashar, maybe to start with you. Well, I mean, this is what we are advocating in our profession, in our kind of organizations. But what I want to highlight, this, is, this should be like a wake up call for everyone, for the citizens, for the uh, local authorities, as well as the central government. I mean, the cities that we build are very uh, fragile for such crises. The public health crisis like the uh, pandemic, the climate crisis that we are all experiencing and the economic crisis. The cities are actually uh, fueling these crises, not making our life more resilient. On the contrary, they are producing these crises and we are experiencing uh, their consequences. So now it should be a wake up call for everyone and we have to demand uh, less uh, kind of speculative development in our cities, less social conflict, but more human nature and uh, putting our kind of the climate at the center of the way in which we approach our cities. Eki? And I think maybe if we can go one of the one of the photos uh, that I was sharing earlier, and I I, re I really also truly believe one of one of the things that we can do is try and see uh, how we can be above the pol pol party politics when we are, for example, looking at the cities and city solutions. And I think there is I mean, most of the people do see the need of it. You know, like we we, we were uh, last year. If can we find the pictures that I uh, from Play Marmara where and yeah late. Uh, Push further, yeah, exactly. One before, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so what you will see is then uh, like a, a, a game where, yeah, exactly this one, where where the the mayors from all kinds of pol political uh, parties are coming together to actually discuss questions of the Marmara region. That's the Istanbul and the region where it is. And I think that such conversations on the on the uh, citizen level, but also on the politicians level, that that you see that they have to communicate to see how they can solve the pollution in Marmara. See, they have to communicate how they can respond to earthquake. And even a question like earthquake at the moment becomes a, a question between different political parties that are, you know, uh, different political public institutions that are actually acting in the same same system. So that, that I think to find methods where conversation is still possible, where we can understand more of each other, where, where, where yeah, yeah, maybe it sounds really, really, no, no. really soft and really no. <laughs> simple, but I think just as simple as that, just communicate with each other more, look into each other's eyes more and, 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 and talk uh, to be able to really talk and listen to each other. No, thank you very much for that. We will uh, definitely see you later on in the program as well. Um, Yashar Adnan Adanele, thank you very much for joining us today and taking the time to share your insights. Um, it's time for the next part of our program in which we will talk with two photographers, visual artists about their work and also their work uh, during uh, the epidemic. Um, these are Bekir Dindar and Sinam Dishli. Uh, we will start with Sinam. Uh, Sinam, welcome very much to our program. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about your work? Yes, sure. Um, 
I should say that uh, actually I'm from uh, Urfa, uh, the city which borders Syria, and um, I've been working on this subject actually Ifratus River and Mesopotamia, but I live half in New York and Istanbul, so I was about to go to New York by the time Corona started in Turkey, but I couldn't. And so uh, my work is usually uh, about uh, taking uh, the you know, environmental issues, I should say, but um, I do a lot of photography, site-specific installations and, and videos. Uh, so during the uh, during the corona, uh, should I should I talk about how it affected sure, you, or should yeah. I talk about more about my work? Yeah, as I'm, I think we are going to showcase your work now, so maybe you can also uh, tell us a little bit uh, about your photography. Sure. Uh, so 10 years ago, I moved to New York and I was going back and forth and literally had different eyes to look at my own culture. And so I uh, start to uh, cur be curious about the Mesopotamia. So it's been 10, t maybe 12 years, actually, I, I worked there. Mm -hmm. I photograph there, do the video, but and it's it's uh, the project is branching out and through the years dealing with complexities, earth and natural of daily cycles, and mm -hmm. as well as as well as the um, flow of materials, focusing on stone, soils, and water. So it's like a lot of. Uh, uh, different elements actually. Uh, so my challenge is how to bring them together in a way uh, to create a, a language. Uh, so these are my last exhibition. Actually, this has happened right before the uh, the Corona. Uh, it's finished. My exhibition finished on, on February 15th. So it was. Uh, uh, it had a lot of uh, actually. Um, I should say outcome, and it was really exciting for me. Uh, there was a lot of offers and projects was about to start, and I was going to again in New York and accepted the residency in America, but none of, none of them happened. Like uh, so, this is like these are the projects that I wanted to develop during this uh, this time for the, uh, when when I am in in the residency. Uh, but it's completely changed, uh, so I should maybe talk about uh, what I did. Uh, yeah, what the... did you do during the pandemic time? Well, first of all, I rejected it to do, to do anything, you know, we were all shocked. And I actually also felt a lot of pressure because people were constantly asking me what I am doing as an artist and what kind of uh, work I can show in that uh, website or this online platform. So I really didn't want to do anything because I was... Uh, stressed and then as, as all the artists and um, I, I really think that uh, it's very important to say in this program also that uh, art, uh, there's a lot of pressure on artists and there's a lot of uh, foundation and, and a, a lot of support and I try to apply during this time but they're all asking you what do you do, you know, what kind of work you produce. So you, at the end, you need to have a product to get a support as an artist. So I think this is a big issue because artists are also human beings and then we also have to pay our rents and etc. So, um, I, but at the same time, this is funny, I want to also say that uh, I actually, uh, when Yasemin reached me for this program also, and I found out I did a lot of things. Uh, inevitably, it's just happened. Um, very little things, but uh, one of them is, uh, is I should talk about uh, distant points. These are, uh, I, was, I was actually thinking about uh, the isolation, that we go through and I found myself uh, pondering on hands and idea of touching on virtual connections that we establish and we desire for physical contact as well as tensions posed by its dangers. So based on these thoughts, uh, I decided to revisit my past work. It's called A Decent Point. So I actually uh, currently producing some cyanotypes, like focusing on hands usually. So what, like what we are craving for. And if there is some more time, I can talk about another uh, exhibition I'm getting ready. Sure, yeah, please. Yes, so this is uh, this is called uh, Crystal Clear actually, and it's uh, it's uh, going to open in Istanbul in Para Museum in September. 
And this exhibition really changed its direction during the pandemic because a curator asked us to uh, focus on this uh, subject as well. So I really did, I also f uh, felt a lot of pressure and, and shared this with the curator and, mm -hmm. and, and said that, the, you know, I don't want to just make work about Corona. You know, this is what this is what I don't want to do. But I was reading a, a, a Mesopotamia history uh, by the time and really focused on this uh, the, this figurine. So again, I thought finally to uh, I've I. I've found a way to bring this work in a dialogue with my old work, Pigment Separation. Uh, so this Pigment Separation is uh, is actually you test the soil and you have uh, you have a pattern uh, with, uh, out of the chemical um, reactions. So you kind of take a picture of soil and then actually, actually uh, without a camera. So this this would be uh, this was the first work I initiated. I wanted to actually share uh, for the ex exhibition, but during this time I changed the direction a little bit, uh, but without really forcing myself. And this was a. Um, uh, little figurines that I got inspired by Mesopotamia. So uh, I call them these believers. Uh, so it has something to do with the experience of screen-based communication and the uh, lack of the touch. Again, uh, I, I really, this is this is a subject I actually, it excites me now. Yeah. And communication and lack of the touch dominates these days of the quarantine. And I guess, uh, ha, uh, so I'm handcrafting these figurines will be uh, my way of regenerating a sense attachment and proximity with my uh, community. And because artist community is also separated. So I thought that, uh, you know, uh, I am going to, uh, make a sculpture of a friend, I mean, and then in a way I'm going to touch it, you know, maybe we are going to have again a Zoom meeting and then, and with with my uh, inspiration from this person, uh, uh, it, it is a way of uh, touching and exchanging and mundan information. So, yeah, I don't know uh, if it is enough. I can't talk about my work forever. <laughs> no, I understand. No, it was very beautiful and very interesting. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, we will go on to uh, Bekir Dindar. Uh, Bekir, uh, merhaba. Uh, hoş geldiniz. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, also with you is um, Arsu uh, Arukan to translate and to talk about your work. But we are very happy that you are joining us uh, as well. So I'm going to direct my questions at Arsu. Um, so Arsu, can you describe, I think we also saw some of Bekir's work, work in the beginning when talking about the current situation. Could you, could you tell a bit more about Bekir's work and also uh, what he uh, made during uh, the epidemic? Actually, Bekir uh, has always lived in Istanbul. He was born here and uh, he lives in the center of the city. So, and he loves photography and he's also a documentary photographer. So he always takes Istanbul's photos, but this time it was something that he was uh, shocked and excited about because uh, everywhere there was curfew and nobody was out and the uh, main uh, attraction centers of the city were totally empty and he really uh, wanted to document those places. So. Um, so yeah, I'm a little bit excited, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. No, uh, I think we're going to see some of the pictures as well. Um, but I can I can uh, imagine because I, I myself, I'm an Amsterdammer and it's it's such a weird thing to see your own city where you grew up so empty. Um, so what was, uh, uh, was it, uh, was it also a, a weird experience to walk around the city? It must have been for Bekir. Of course, because Istanbul is a huge city. It's almost 20 million. And uh, it's a really weird uh, sensation to see the city empty like that. Uh, plus he wanted to also document the funny side of the situation because uh, it was also, uh, there were some uh, precautions taken and these, uh, and these became really tragicomic scenes with uh, people trying to live with the virus and uh, they were, it's, it was like a fight between people and the virus. 
So, and, and was he allowed to go everywhere or were there also restrictions doing his work? Uh, let me ask. Peki yeah, şimdi sure. Sin o halde gitmene izin veriliyor muydu? Halde gidiyor muydu? Yoksa tamamen kısıtlı mıydı her şey fotoğraf çektiğin zaman? Yok aslında her yer e, gidebiliyordu. E, aynı zamanda <gülüyor> foto muhabirliği de yapabildiğim için problem olmuyordu. Yani her tarafa gidebiliyordum. Çalışırken <gülüyor> bir yaşamadım hiç. Since he's a photojournalist, uh, he was allowed to go out, but normally nobody else was allowed to go out. Okay, so and and um, uh, because the, the the city has been reopening for the past few weeks, um, is he also planning on on doing more uh, work uh, uh, photography focused on 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 the epidemic and how the city is changing again? Uh, because in Istanbul, the city is changing. Yeni gelişmeler sonrasında. E, tabii ki arzu. Sonuçta süreç devam ederken sürekli yeni e, anlar oluyor. Yeni e, önlemler oluyor. Yeni tedbirler oluyor. Bunların takibinde insanların tepkileri değişiyor. E, süreci aslında her anda fotoğraflıyorum. Yani e, her gün, ertesi gün ne olacağına dair merakla bekliyoruz. E, since you don't know what's going to happen the next day here... Uh, he, uh, Bekir says he's going to continue his work because uh, every day is a new day and you have uh, new scenes everywhere. That's very, we are very uh, also excited to see those pictures in the future. So thank you both very much for, for taking the time to join us today. Also Sinan, uh, additionally, also thank you very much for joining us. Um, so Ekim, you have also listened to and, and, and looked at the, the beautiful work we have just seen. What, do you what did you think of the projects and pictures? I think that the, the first artist about Sinan, S yeah. S uh, the girl. Yeah, 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 Sinan, yeah. Sibel, I think, right? Well, I think her work about uh, longing for the physical yeah. contact, I, I totally understand it. I mean, that's also, I mean, our practice is really based on like a being in a physical space together and building trust related to that. And uh, of course, we have heard right away, oh, the, like after the, the, the lockdown, a lot of people here in the Netherlands looking into participation oh can we actually digitally participate like hey like innovation let's do let's do webinars and that's digital participation and i think that that is not not going i hope that that's not going to be the new uh, practice let's say that actually the 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 cities are physical spaces and the, when we are making cities it should also partly be st uh, able to stay physical and i, I think i could really right away uh, see uh, mm. the parallels and, and the longing for physical space in that sense and I think Bekir's work is amazing. I mean, I think it's such a special work. I think it, it will, I mean, over the years, that work will actually, I think, yeah. become more and more valuable. Probably we will never see of a, such an Istanbul again. And this was a very special moment. It was such a good idea to document it. It's really, congratulations for the nice work. It's really amazing to see. Also, I, I, go, I go to Istanbul every every two months. Because of the lockdown, I'm here like more than three months. It's also for me, it's shocking to see how, for example, all these squares that are normal filled with animals people are totally empty it's amazing <laughs> no it will definitely also be historic work and also i like that bekir is continuing also to photograph the yeah. city now yeah. with the measures being a bit lighter and and it's opening up so that will be very interesting also in the future to look back on yeah we are following see, with excitement the rest yeah. of the work <laughs> <laughs> to see the city changing so oh Oh, I heard that we're going to show, be, because I was wondering, because I didn't see the pictures as well. Oh, but I heard that, ah, Arsu and Bekir, you're still with us, uh, thank God. There was something going wrong with the pictures before. I'm sorry, I, because I'm not always sure if we can see it or not, but they weren't there. Oh my God, so we're going to look at it again. <laughs> yeah, we saw this one. We did see this one, yeah. But uh, that, yes, this is uh, the Kudalka uh, series. That was the inspiration, like there was, I think. Exactly. So, <coughs> Arsu, feel free if you want to tell something about the pictures to, to say something. It's a, it's a photograph of Kudelka's occupation series. It's an inspiration from that photograph. It was, a, it was, the, it was a, during the Czech people resistance against the Soviet Union invasion. Mm -hmm. And this is like, a, it was like the invasion of COVID-19. You know, it was like an inspiration between those... Uh, Soviet invasion or like COVID-19 invasion. So he wanted uh, to, Bekir wanted to document uh, and 
show the uh, places, empty places. And um, these are the most crowded places in Istanbul. So you can see, I think this is Taksim, around Taksim. Sultan Ahmet, Ortaköy. They were all empty. No one was out. No, it's amazing. It's unbelievable. I think it was even more quiet than in Amsterdam. It was also uh, totally empty here. It, only for like two weeks. How, how long a period was it in Istanbul? I think in, in Amsterdam that it was so empty was maybe for only two weeks. Was that the same in Istanbul? Actually, it was uh, during the weekends. It was full curfew. Uh, but uh, during the weekdays, uh, only um, young people were, weren't allowed and uh, plus 65 oh, yeah. people. Um, so now then I'm going to thank you again <laughs> for taking the time to be here. And uh, we will go on to the final part uh, of the program in which we will discuss the, uh, the impact of Corona on the art and cultural uh, sector in Istanbul. So uh, we have uh, four amazing guests uh, to discuss this. Uh, these are uh, Bige Örer, uh, the director of Istanbul Biennale and of the Istanbul Foundation for Culture and Arts. Kubra Uzun, a performer and DJ. Uh, Pinar Akurt, artist and designer. And Hakan Sela Sezole, a founder and director of ATA Festival. Um, we will go to Kubra first, but first we will hear uh, a song, uh, an anthem made for Pride, Pride Week, which is happening right now in Istanbul and has the final weekend, this weekend as I understand. So we will first listen to the anth anthem. Günüm aydın, dedik ama yaptık çoktan baydın. Şimdi sıra bizde, hadi gözün aydın. Tek vücut olduk, hadi riyen aş. Hadi riyen aş, hadi canım koş. E özgürüz aşkım, böyle daha hoş. Ağır ve haykır, bugün sıra sende. Her yeri günde, bizlere bende. Kibra'mızda. <gülüyor> 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 Yes, Küb Kübra uh, Uzun, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, uh, this song, how it came about, and of course about your work? Hello everyone, and happy Pride. Happy uh, Pride. Do you hear me? Yes, definitely. You're a bit... Yes, definitely. Happy yeah. Pride and uh, hello to everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, well, um, um, as an HIV positive person, when I uh, got the name uh, of uh, Infected City is the title, I got just offended. But anyway, I just skipped. No, this no, but please, I, I understand else. why you say it. No, but I, I'm happy you threw it in because if you feel that way, you should definitely say it. It was meant as like a broadened, but very good to make this point. Thank you for making the point. Yes, yes, I am infected in an infected city. Welcome <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, this song, uh, I just wrote the lyrics like 20 days ago, uh, suddenly in 20 minutes. Then uh, I shared it with a friend of mine, DJ and a producer, Chalar, Mr. Sur, a mixer. Uh, then in 10 days, uh, we did the production and the song. And this Sunday, on the Istanbul Parade Day, the song will be released um, for all of us. Uh, the main title for this year's Pride in Istanbul is Where Am I? Ben Nardim. And uh, the song also asks where we are and asks for equality. Uh, also, Pembe Hayat uh, organization in Ankara just released, uh, just uh, decorate, sorry, a manifesto about this on the uh, 18th of uh, June. Um, and the title also in this manifesto is uh, Equality. So we are all human beings and we need to be equal. But in this white supremacy and a world around this uh, circuit by, 
uh, it will be hard to achieve uh, to the equal uh, um, system and equal equality in general, let's say. Oh, you but our fight will come. We are exist, Yani. We exist, and we need to be equal. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway. I just, I just, I just told about the manifesto and the, the uh, song. Uh, it's like 1990s Vogish uh, ballroom uh, speech. I'm just telling about those issues in this song, and it will be an anthem, I assume, soon uh, in Turkey and globally. And it is the first uh, song that XSM recordings released. So, how am I doing? Well, I'm stuck at home, uh, but luckily alive, let's say. Um, first month, it was just bizarre, as we all had uh, internationally, uh, but then I got used to, uh, to live with uh, corona. And now, if you ask me, it's not easy. I mean, I mostly spend my time and still at home. Going out doesn't come to my mind uh, like I used to uh, have, uh, have, uh, have like on the streets more than home, but like for after the lockdown uh, finished in Istanbul like a couple of weeks ago, I still find myself uh, staying at home, doing nothing but staying at home. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, as a DJ and a performer and an LGBTQ. I plus uh, rights activist. Uh, what am I doing? I'm. Um, I just release. I'm, I'm just about to release this song uh, first, and I help for the manifesto of Pembe Hayat also. Uh, lastly, and I'm working on a project uh, with a Turkish friend and a, a creator and an artist of mine, collaboration with a. Uh, artist and a writer and the project will be online exhibition uh, including panels and the parties between Dutch and Turkish artists to create solidarity and um, um, and all let's say uh, I'm, I'm coordinating that project and also I'm writing and um, uh, giving three different uh, radio programs all about uh, classical Western music. One is all about queer classical Western uh, composers and music, and the rest about, in general, classical Western music. And uh, let me tell you, lastly, I told, uh, I think, uh, more than enough about myself, but I am not important as my community. I mean, my community is more important uh, than uh, me, let's say. We have two fundraising campaigns. Uh, running for three months after the lockdown, uh, the queer night workers in Istanbul and in Turkey just got stuck, uh, as I am still. Uh, we all, we don't have any governmental uh, support mm. and um, any insurance also. Suddenly we got out of work. Clubs are closed, bars are closed. Um, so we just create two fund fundraising campaigns. I just share the links. You can uh, see the yeah. in the chats uh, the two of the separate links. Yeah, if that. you click on, you can see the detailed English explanation on both about what we are, uh, why we are doing this, and uh, where the money goes. You can read the detailed texts and the information, and please do. And please, uh, I'll be glad if everyone can share those links with their networks so uh, you know how it works. Um, I mean, we have friends, they don't see their families, uh, they're out of the families, now they're out of the job. So uh, even a penny is important for them. So I'll be glad if you can share those, those networks with uh, people around you and your networks. Thank you. 
Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. And we will definitely uh, uh, share that and uh, put it on our website. Um, so Pinar, uh, you are also with us. You are an artist and designer. Um, could you please tell us a little bit about your work and, and also um, maybe to, to add on what Kubra has been telling about how this period has been for you also as an artist? Hello to all. Hi. Hi. Uh, I, I think... Uh, I'm sorry. My sound okay? I don't yes. hear. Yes. Yeah, no, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah, no, okay, it's great. I can hear. Okay. Uh, nice to meet, meet also with Kubra and also I like his song and the problems he has and the campaign he uh, they made. I think we all have like uh, similar uh, problems. So it's nice to hear uh, different thoughts. And uh, in my case, uh, I mostly work in the upcycling and the waste. And uh, I make mostly installations and uh, sculptures in, in different scales. And I mostly use uh, easy to find materials, family, familiar objects in simple and colorful ways. Mm. But uh, this took me to the waste problem. And when I uh, first read about that, the humankind is the only species capable of uh, generating waste. It's really unbelievable. And it's been like tons of plastic floating in the oceans. And it's been uh, just 150 years the plastic has been discovered. And if you think in the human history, it's really a short uh, period of time. So I'm really obsessed with uh, waste and what to do with them. So I also found the upcycling library and trying to share what I learned and know about these uh, soon to be waste materials, because we all have to act and reduce our waste. And uh, people should like, uh, stop uh, like uh, they own the planet they act like they own it but we have to learn coexist with the planet so i try to um, focus on these kind of things i can and, say so and, and and how has the the crisis impacted your uh, creative process and 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 your work as an artist the corona the um, commercial works has stopped because i mostly make like store windows or we were going to make an interactive ins giant installation. So lots of people were going to be involved. So they are all stopped. But I spent this time focus on the, my work, the upcycling library and uh, trying to make more useful things. We have to change our habits and consumption. And most of the things I, I'm rethinking about the future, actually. So, and also as, as, as Kubra also was describing, um, there is, is, is not a lot of, um, not, uh, there is some aid, but not too much. So how, is, how does that work? So for example, in the Netherlands, there was some aid packages for the cultural sector, but not so much for individual artists. Yeah. Is that the same in, in Istanbul? Yeah, nothing for individual artists and designers. I... We have nothing, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah. No, I really stopped expecting something from the government or we don't even think about that. We got used to be our own, actually. So I'm also mostly self-initiated person. Uh, so I try to figure out, make things, useful things. And this uh, time uh, period, I made uh, DIY masks, uh, how to make, no suit, uh, DIY uh, from the pillowcase, a non-woven bag, and uh, the t-shirt and bandana, they are really simple. In the library, because I try to show really simple things, even not uh, skillful people can make. So, because at the beginning, the masks were really expensive in Turkey, and then you couldn't find, and if you found it, they were really expensive, and I was really mad about it, because it's... Uh, Mm, right of health rights. It's the main right, and we have to think about the waste we have uh, because it's one of the problems of the climate crisis. And I think the pandemic is also uh, mm, consequences of the climate crisis. So they are all connected. So my steps are really small steps, but just I try to remind people and think about 
uh, the waste. Uh, we have to reduce them. So I made uh, with my partner, Janda Shishman, he took the pictures and I designed the maths and another friend just made the edit editor. So we are three people made these uh, posts. Thank you. Yeah. So also uh, uh, join us, joining us in this conversation is uh, Hakan Silla Zizolle, uh, founder and director of the ATA Festival. Welcome very much, Hakan. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, maybe we're going to see a trailer first, I guess, from uh, ATA Festival. And then uh, maybe you could afterwards explain a bit about ATA Festival. Hello and Hi. good evening from Istanbul. Uh, my name is Hakan and I'm the founder and director of ATA Festival, which is an international arts festival for babies and children and the first and only one of its kind in Turkey. Um, the festival runs two to three weeks each year around the Children's Rights Day, 20 November. And we present different art forms from theater to dance, music to film, installation to exhibition. Um, we might have around 30 or more activities in each festival. And um, how we do that, we go around the world, uh, visit festivals, showcases, and program the best possible work for zero to 12 years old children and their parents. We had our first edition of the festival in 2016, and we presented artists from, of course, Turkey and the Netherlands and Denmark, France, Hungary, Israel, Lithuania, Mexico, Scotland, Spain, and Sweden. Um, and it's, it might be a surprise, a good surprise, that um, our upcoming edition, which, will be, which we will be celebrating our fifth edition, it will be a, there will be a Dutch focus. So we will invite companies from the Netherlands hmm. uh, between 20 November and 13 December. And apart from the festival, which is around November, December, we run events throughout the year. There are some artist programs, you know, uh, events for teachers or for families. So we try to combine our work, you know, with the year uh, program apart from the festival. And we really like to show the best possible of work from around the world. So if a child seeing a great work in New York, in Berlin, in London or Amsterdam, we want our children in Turkey to experience the same kind of work and not to be left behind. So, and, and how was your festival affected by uh, the lockdown and the pandemic? Uh, we were fine for the last edition of the festival, but for the upcoming edition, of course, we are planning some, you know, different plans, plan A, B, C. <laughs> uh, and, and for our usual work, uh, which is spread around the year, we had to cancel some of the shows. So instead, we started doing some online work and very limited online work, I can say. And um, so we had a fantastic uh, Dutch collaboration, Turkish Dutch collaboration called Wanted Rabbit, a performance for three years up, three years and up. And we put this online for families to be able to see it if they, if they haven't seen it so far. Mm -hmm. And we also um, started running some programs also for children and for families. We had weekly yoga classes for kids. Also, we had a workshop called I Read and I Dream, where we use Swedish literature and use you know, a platform where we can invite kids to participate actively and using their imagination, they can take the story to the next point. So, but um, uh, preparing with a plan A, B and C, that, that must be also quite intense and, and difficult because you're not sure what to expect in November. How, does, how do you try to do that? Well, what we try to do is we choose, for, for this year especially, we chose uh, shows that can be flexible. So uh, not all of them are completely for conventional stages. Uh, we can go to museums, we can go to other indoor spaces, which is more flexible. And we choose shows that doesn't require like a full set and full lighting. So in that way, we try to 
make a balance in our program. So, and uh, what Kubra was saying before, for, for individual artists, there is nothing. Uh, if you talk about support or aid packages, how is that for uh, a festival like uh, ATA Festival? Well, um, I can say for individual artists, for theater makers, there is a very limited support, but this is, uh, this initiative comes from private sector. Mm. So, some of the theater makers in solidarity, they started uh, one or two different campaigns where they are supporting stage, you know, uh, stage technicians, maybe directors, writers and actors who are not able to work in the times of Corona day. So um, it, it's very little, but I think it's, it's a very strong initiative. So also joining us in this conversation um, is Bige Orer, for, uh, the director of Istanbul Biennial and uh, also of the Istanbul Foundation for Culture and Arts. Uh, welcome, Bige. Thank you very much also for joining us. Uh, can you tell us about the, uh, your foundation? Yes, uh, welcome, everyone. Um, the Istanbul Foundation for Culture and Arts basically is a non-profit and non-governmental organization uh, which is active in the field of culture and arts for 48 years. Uh, the foundation aims at offering the finest uh, examples of art from around the world uh, and at the same time supporting the local art scene, creating an international platform of dialogue and debate. Um, and the foundation organizes the film, music, jazz, theater festivals, as well as the Istanbul Biennial and the Design Biennial. And uh, ICASEV is also dedicated to contributing to development of cultural policies. And during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, ICASEV continued to work with the aim of supporting the field of arts and culture in Turkey and find ways to uh, engage with its communities through digital platforms. In April, the Cultural Policy uh, Department of uh, ICASEB has published a new cultural policy text titled The Uniting Power of Art, uh, Arts and Needs of the Cultural Field During the Pandemic. And the text opened up the discussion about what kind of support mechanisms have been introduced for creative industries in the world and which measures should be taken in the cultural field in Turkey. So emphasizing the social value of culture and arts, it made a call to the public authorities as well as the private sector and also the individual donors to provide funds and grants to support arts and culture for its capacities in community building and solidarity in the cultural field. And the pandemic made visible all the economic uh, precarities and inequalities in the cultural and artistic field in Turkey, as well as the rest of the world. And it seemed important to us to rethink about different formats of collaboration and solidarity in our field. Istanbul Music Festival has created the Musician Support Fund, aiming to support professional musicians in the field of classical music who are not already affiliated with a state or private orchestra and who were obliged to suspend their independent activities. So the fund creates an online uh, platform for musicians to perform freely while securing an income for them. Ikaseve also um, partnered um, with Netflix and Cinema and Broadcasting Union of Turkey to create a COVID-19 film and television relief fund to help the hardest hit workers in the Turkish creative community. Uh, the fund managed by ICASEV and Cinema and Broadcasting Union and set up with a 4 million uh, lira donation from Netflix aims to provide a short-term relief to thousands of workers and freelancers affected by the halt in productions across Turkey. We also initiated a, <clears throat> a new co-production project together with four other culture and arts institutions based in Istanbul, namely BKM, Dastas, Enka, Sanat and Zorlu, <laughs> to provide support for new theater productions in Turkey. Um, but I would also like to uh, talk uh, more about other forms of solidarity that emerged during COVID crisis. Um, so and, and if you want me to continue, yeah no because yes yeah because that would be very interesting to hear. So what forms of solidarity also emerged during the crisis? Um, there is an initiative which is titled Omus, um, which started as a sharing network among those 
uh, uh, working and producing in the visual arts, bringing together those who want to receive financial support with those who want to give support. And it is initiated by a group of workers from Istanbul who believe in the urgency of unrelocated uh, resource sharing and cooperation. There is another collective, an artist collective, which is called Isole Project, uh, which was also formed to create a meeting point and a discussion point uh, by artists and for artists coming from different disciplines and who have been already involved in some uh, ways of collective working. And as an online collective, storytelling has been important uh, to inspire each other. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, because of the time, we have to close off. But I would really uh, very much like to thank you, uh, Bige, Kubra, Pinar and Hakan for joining us this evening and sharing uh, uh, your stories and, and insights. Um, so that leaves us uh, with the with a take home message from Ekim, if you're up for that. Could you do you have some final words for us? Wow, I think uh, the um, I mean it gives you hope. Huh? It's I think the the most of the beautiful people and the work that we have seen tonight you don't get in the mainstream media, not in the Netherlands, but also probably not in Turkey. So I think that is good to see. On the other hand, I mean we have to be also realistic. I think we have seen also how I mean the, I think the the, the 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 health crisis we are in. Uh, has kind of rendered clearly what is important, what's not important. And we have seen how uh, health and education and you know, certain public sectors, how we have to be treat, treating them differently. And in the case of Turkey, those institutions are really in coma. You see that they are, I mean, if they are doing something, they are targeting at each other. Individual artists are saying that we exist and we, we need our rights, we need to be equal, we, have, we are here and they are not served. And um, maybe there again, a little bit of hopeful story is that, I mean, whatever happens on the political layer, you see a, a society that is young and that is creative and that is holding on to or trying to find help from each other or, you know, finding the, trying to survive in certain ways. And that is hopeful to see. I mean, I, that, Turkey has a really young and, and well-educated and creative population. It is, I mean, the, hopefully the political scene and atmosphere will change and, and hopefully this, this generation will thrive. I mean, that, that's what I would say, uh, like hope, let's say, the, for, the, for the evening as a result. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. And also thank you very much, um, uh, also many thanks to our esteemed guests and audience, of course, for your digital presence today. And many thanks to Pakhuis de Zwijger and Dutch Culture for bringing about these series. Uh, you can watch back the previous editions at the Pakhuis de Zwijger website or on YouTube. Uh, also, Dutch Culture will write an article about each individual program on their website. Next Thursday, we will meet again. Then we will talk more about the current situation in Tokyo. Have a nice evening and stay healthy.